right. Hello, everyone. It is always strange to talk to a computer that is in complete silence. Uh, so I'm happy to have three guests here as well. Not in my room, unfortunately. Unfortunately, And I'm also very happy to see a lot of attendees. Uh, before we open up our discussion, and I am giving, uh, I'm giving introductions about, and the floor to Rachel, Shamira, and Mohammed, I will first tell you a bit more about this panel. We also start with a part of the program of the support program of the International oh, Talent of Breda Photo. I hear someone talking, so maybe it's good to mute all your microphones. Um, so thank you for all being here and attending this webinar where we talk with and about filmmakers and photographers who share personal family stories through their lenses with a wider audience. Instead of finding their stories far away from home, they turn the camera to the place where they grew up, their homes and to their family. It puts them and their family members in a vulnerable situation. This leads more than often to intense dilemma for the photographer or filmmaker. Who am I to point my, to point my camera to the ones I love? The situation they end up in during the making of the work and sharing it with an audience brings difficult choices. Fragile projects do expose their family, who are almost naked in front of the camera, and their own position as artists comes under threat. Am I working with, the, with my family as a director? And do I have to make artistic decisions to unravel a difficult family issue? Or am I here with them still being the daughter or the son who is here to help and love them unconditionally? Both positions seem to be equally undesirable, but on the other hand, aren't they the ones that are the most equipped to interfere in family life, to explore what happens or happens, as they are not outsiders, but insiders, of course. We will talk in this panel about the responsibilities they feel during and after the process of the production of their work. It was by, well, it's not really a coincidence, but that I sit here. This is my, the room of my uh, youngest daughter. She's not in this room anymore. But when I was setting up my camera, I was looking at what is behind me on the left on the, on the chalkboard. And I think you can't read it, but it is very, um, well, bit of a coincidence, it's here, so I will read her motto. Uh, because when I think she was 15, she wrote down, your home should tell the story of who you are and be a collection of what you love. So that's over there, and that's what we are going to talk about. Um, the panel is a collaboration between the Department of Photography, Film and the Digital of the St. Joost and Breda Photo, of course. And before we start, and I'm going to introduce our guest of today, uh, we are going to show two video pitches, which are both part of the support program. And the support program is the final step of the international talent program of Breda Photo Festival. For the support program, the festival wishes to enter into a two-year commitment with three upcoming talents. During the two-year support program, Breda Photo assists the selected artist on how to connect to an international photography scene using their long and established network. The support will be customized to the needs, to the very specific needs of each selected individual. For this selection process, the participating academies were to select, were, were asked to select one candidate from their alumni, graduated as at least two years ago and no more than five years. And these 10, ten candidates will pitch their proposal in a three minute video and each panel features two candidates. So therefore, I'm really happy to present you the pitches of first, I think that will be the first one, Valentino Stellino from the CASC in Antwerpen, and secondly, the pitch of Eva Kreuger, who graduated at the St. Joost a few years ago. And I hope that the host will start the videos now. Hi, my name is Eva Kreuger. I am an artist from the Netherlands and I was selected as alumnus for the support program of Breda Photo by AKV St. Joost. So first I would like to tell you a bit more about the way I work. Uh, I always start from my archives and they are collections of found analog imagery, my own photography 
and studio experiments. I also reuse older works and images of former exhibitions. My work always reflects on themes I encounter, such as love, uh, loss or grief. By exploring the language of the images and materials I use, I combine my photographic work and sculptures into visual narratives and these are usually presented in the form of installations. Currently I've started to work with the physical archive itself as an object uh, using my studio space as a canvas to experiment with my sculptures and installations and I organize my collections to create new narratives while thinking about the way we uh, store our images, uh, what is worth keeping and what do we protect. So the setting of my studio and also the fact that I started using the space visibly into my images inspired me to introduce the context of the building into my work. I'm incorporating the research on the studio itself, the way it functions not only as a place of production but also as a place to retreat and reflect. So my plan, um, during the next two years I would like to continue my archival projects and and studio research and to be able to do this I would like to exhibit my work because exhibitions have proven to be a very important part of my working process and there are some exhibition plans on hold right now because of the corona crisis so I hope that in the upcoming two years there will be possibilities to continue with these plans. A support program would be very uh, useful for my practice at this moment. Uh, I am very enthusiastic about making new connections but I could could use a little help with that. So for the upcoming two years I would like uh, to get supported by Breda Photo by, um, let me check my list, by connecting me to exhibition locations or festivals um, and to help me find the right way to introduce myself and come across better uh, in, uh, for example, open calls or portfolio reviews, assisting me uh, with my current application for funding. Uh, assist me in finding a residency, have conversations and feedback sessions about new work and conversations about presentation, visibility and ways to sell my work. So, um, of course, I hope my goals uh, fit with the vision Breda Photo has for the support program and it would be great to get connected with Breda Photo in this way. Um, so, yeah, I'm very curious about the outcome and let's see how it goes. My name is Valentina Celino and this is my pitch for Beda Photo. I followed my relatives for a really long time with my camera, mostly making images of daily situations where actually something and nothing was really happening. Lately I started taking more pictures of my girlfriends, mostly in private moments. I would call it girlhood behind the scenes. This is a topic I would like to work on for Beda Photo. Today, social media is a big part of our society. Also, the girl power movement is something that is shown a lot, for example, on Instagram. It became also something trendy. My question was, did this movement really change something? On social media, it looks like it. But did it change behind the scenes? What I discovered was, for me, behind the scenes, it did not really change. With this project, I don't want to capture stereotype situations, but neither stage my own work. Therefore, I would like to invite you for the girlhood behind the scenes. I think it's also an important topic to capture for our next generation, that social media is only a small part of what you want people to see, and mostly it's only selectively positive. So I think if you grow up with social media, it's difficult to see what is still real. As a photographer, I would like to show you different situations of girlhood in daily life and give you other perspectives. Are things really changing or are we still far behind? In my series, I'm not planning to give you the answer, but I would like to open people's view and minds about this topic. I would like to include more different situations, also by traveling to my family members and see if it's the same as well over there as in Belgium. I'm convinced that capturing these situations are important for our next generation. What we see on social media is what we want to see. I think it's still important to show what's really happening or still happening behind the scenes. 
that the movements on social media shows that we want to change the world, but that there is still a long way to go. And only by capturing moments that shows us what's still happening can maybe change something. Not just the outside, but also the inside. I want the viewers to recognize themselves and make their own interpretations of the situations that I capture. I think it's so important that the realness of this topic shouldn't get lost in social media. Okay, well, that was the other way around. First, Eva and then Valentino. I wish you both good luck, Mr. Pitch, and I enjoyed them. Um, okay, I will briefly introduce the three panelists, and uh, then I will give them the floor to show some recent work and share that with you. And later on, I will open the floor to questions. So please don't hold back uh, if you already have a question, but be aware that I only halfway the panel, I will turn to your questions. Um, you can do that by using the Q&A button. So not in chat, but via the Q&A button. Um, first of all, I would like to briefly introduce you, Mohammed Somji. Warm welcome. He's enjoying us from Dubai. For the second time, he's a guest curator for Breda Photo. As said, he lives and works in Dubai as curator and photographer. He's a founder of the Cool Photo Plus, a Dubai-based photography gallery and community organization. In documenting the life in the Gulf region, he tries to give a more nuanced picture of that part of the world. Next to that, he explores his own family stories, having a Tanzanian nationality with Indian roots and living in Dubai for the last 40 years. Mohammed will later on share with us his personal work he will also reflect on why it's so important to show the world from the perspective of a great diversity of voices and image makers. And he touches upon a work that he selected for this year's edition of Breda Photo. Then I would like to briefly introduce Shamira Rafaela. Shamira grew up in Aruba. After finishing art schools in the Netherlands, the Rietveld and Artes, she became one of today's most important voices of filmmakers in the Netherlands who turned the camera towards their own family and culture. Her loving father and brother figured as main characters in her film. She received many awards and outstanding reviews because of her experimental and fresh visual language and brave approach of her subject. Recently, she wrote about her dilemma while being in a position of director and pointing the camera to her private family life. Her film seemed to, seems to turn against her and her family, and she felt compelled to, to stop shooting her latest film. We surely talk about this later on. And then I would like to welcome our third guest, who is Rachelle van Uden, who grew up in between Sur Suriname and Dutch family members in Den Bosch. She has a fascination for other people's behavior and interaction with each other. She's an observer, and tries to understand how identity is shaped and formed by the environment you live in. She just graduated from the department photography, film and the digital at the St. Joost with a project that circles around these interests while portraying her loved ones. And in fact, this work will be exhibited for the first time in about two weeks on the graduation show. Hi, Rachelle. I would indeed like to start with you for an introduction of your work. So please go ahead. And take your time. Okay, thank you. Well, hello, I'm uh, Rochelle Venuda, I'm 24 years old and I'm the daughter of a Surinamese mother and a Dutch father. Um, like you said, uh, I'm raised and based in Sertogenbosch, the Netherlands, and recently graduated. Um, I finished my study with my project Melat en Famili. Um, it's a project, personal project, about my family members and their view on identity, Black Pete and Black Lives Matter. Um, I portrayed all my family members and spoke to them about those three topics. And um, the final form of this book, of this project, will be in uh, the form of a book and um, eventually we showed in an uh, exhibition. I will show you some um, pictures of the project that I made. Okay. So this is my family, my mom and my dad. <laughs> Mm 
my grandfather. My other grandfather from Suriname. So those were some pictures I made during this project. Um, I actually started this project uh, because of a comment of my uh, white grandpa. Um, in December 2029, uh, since the class died, um, he said, those people should stop whining. Black Pete has always been black and must remain black. If they disagree, they should go back to their own countries. I was kind of shocked um, and asked him, but what about me and my mom? But he said, no, not you, you're one of us. And I started wondering how my other family members thought um, about Black Pete, their identity and uh, the Black Lives Matter movement that was rising up. Thank you, Rochelle. Um... Maybe a first question to you. Uh, what, did you what did you learn uh, when you made this project? Um, not only about yourself, but also about your family. What did you unravel in your family? Um, within your family? During those conversations, I got to know a few things that I never actually knew um, about um, things within the walls uh, of, the, of those families. And um, kind of personal stories that I am, I was not sure if I could share it with the public or not. Um, for example, a conversation um, between my um, uncle, in, uncle by marriage uh, about racism. He had a conversation about me, uh, to me with, um, sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> He told me that his son uh, got into a um, conflict uh, during ice hockey. Um, we started ice hockey, playing ice hockey at a young age. And in the beginning, he got name calling like, um, hey, Black Pete. So that's kind of innocent in the beginning. But at the end of his ice hockey career, when he was 16, um, it ended up with, um, hey, Kankerneger or literally translation, cancer and nigger. So those were stories I didn't, I never heard about and they were kind of shocking to me because I, I didn't know about it. Yeah, I can, I can imagine. And what you already mentioned briefly in your presentation is that uh, during the making of your project, um, the Black Lives Matter movement indeed gained worldwide attention because of the cruel murder on George Floyd. Um, had that, did it has, had an, uh, had a, have a direct impact on your project or? Um, during that uh, conversation with my grandpa in 2000, December 2019, um, I didn't really know what to do with my project because he gave me something to think about. I was kind of pushed to the way to think about how other people were thinking about Black Pete. So I really didn't, I really didn't care about it at first. Mm -hmm. um, I was also kind of pushing it away. Like, well, I don't care if he's black. I don't mind. I don't mind it. But then I was thinking about when I was younger, I was at elementary school and people called me Black Pete. And I didn't like that either. 
Um, and I had a conversation with my grandpa uh, again in July. And I noticed that he was thinking about it differently right now because of that Black Lives Matter movement, because of all those protests. And um, he was more understanding and also figured out that things need to change. So that's a big improvement. Yeah, yeah. And one final question before I head to Shamira and we surely come back um, to you, of course. Um, uh, did, you do, did you choose and select a specific family for your project? Um, yes, I did. Uh, at first I thought my family is, my family is mixed. So um, I have the, the, the Suriname side is way bigger than the white side, the, mm -hmm. the Dutch side. <laughs> um, but I was thinking about who is really my inner circle? Who do I see? very often, maybe once in a month, or who mm -hmm. do I see? And that, those people, 36 people, um, I, thought, I took pictures of them, and um, those were the only people that I um, pointed my camera on. Okay, thank you so much for introducing your work, uh, Rachel. Um, I then would like to give the stage to Shamira. Uh, please, go along. Yes, thanks for that great introduction. Can I hire you that you can like introduce me <laughs> every time, everywhere I go? <laughs> I will do that yeah. for you, for sure. <laughs> so hi everybody, um, nice to meet you. So I'm Shamira um, and the film that I want to talk to you or that I want to show you um, a piece of, piece of is called Deal With It. And this is a film that's already a bit older. Um, I made this film, I think, seven years ago it is um, and I decided to make this film um, because I had already been working as a director for uh, about five six years and I was shooting uh, all those big reality shows that you see on tv and it didn't feel good because I felt like this is not my reality this is not the real life um, and the real life the life that I was with, living with my family um, I only saw on the news because my dad and my brother um, were deeply into drugs and in the criminal system, in and out of jail. Um, so really a totally different side of society than um, what I was filming in my reality shows. And I also felt like we weren't represented in the right way and I was tired of everybody else telling our story. Um, so I decided that I needed to make a film about my family. Also, because I felt like if I really want to be a good documentary maker and if I want to ask other people in front of my lens um, to be vulnerable and to open up to me, I need to do that as well. Um, so for me, it was only fair to start off with portraying my family in that way. So I'll now share um, a scene with you. This is a scene about it's my dad hanging out with his friends in his living room. Um, yeah. Welcome to his world, I guess. Hey, Yes. 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 
Aí que não tá chegando nunca, meu irmão. Você não vai lembrar. Você é mestiça. Você é mestiça. Você não vai lembrar. É. Agora, agora. É. Agora, agora. É. Ehi, hey, che ne era? Yeah. Non rabbia, non mi raccoglio. Oh? Uh -huh. E' 50 euro come ti inquagna? Oh? Uh -huh. Mi puoi andare qui? Ma ci muo rabbia, si è, si è pa, mi mio. Mi sono molto cansata. Vai, mi aiuto. 50, ma mi saluto. Ma che cosa fai? Ah, ma come? Cosa fai? Come si rovina? Ma usa me da donna. Ma capi un po'? Però mi dà per una, ma se dà per una, no, c'è meno. Dà per una, ma dà per una. Dà per chi che ti danno 50 euro? Mi sa che mi dà se c'è meno, muori. Dai, giù, a pochissimo. Singing, don't worry about the things. Every little thing is gonna be alright. Mas tu usa tu com os bruxa. Mas não vou querer usar com os bruxa assim aqui. Ah, com os bruxa aqui, já viram? Que tá com os bruxa? Com os bruxa tu usa heroína primeiro, depois você usa metadão, depois você usa crack. Tu com de um dia. Usa crack. Já viram só o de usar crack. Mas cabe uma crack, toch? Ai, que com crack, a mão é tão que como tá tendo com o botão crack. Agora vou ter um momento de crack. Ai, mi io non preoccupa, buba sopra. Quando ti accogli un biaso? Ma io? Bij Burgernet ontvang je een bericht als er iets aan de hand is in jouw poort. Ma io, mi intomo. In dit bericht wordt je bijvoorbeeld gevraagd uit te kijken naar een inbreker. Zo doe je zelf iets aan de veiligheid in jouw buurt. Wat gaan daar voor vrijkens aan het wijn? Zie. Zo, de. Nee, mijn ding is tegen je mannen. Nou. Pero con bi biológico, claro, te tengo que un dolce. Mmm, está bom. Bom, mamá. Me está bom, está bom. Sí. Joder. Bienvenido a la Tierra. Sí, bueno. Sí, bueno. It's a bit weird for me to watch it now because my dad passed away um, last year. So anyway, it's good to see it because then I feel like he's still alive, but it's also a bit weird to see it again and to talk about it. But here we are. And that's the consequence when you make personal films, you're gonna have to talk about it for the rest of your career. <laughs> Whether you like it or not, you have to get naked every time. So let's do this. Thank you so much, Shamira, for uh, sharing this uh, fragment with us then. And indeed, I want you to talk about this. Uh, that's why we are uh, here. Um, first of all, I think that's something that uh, we could also see in this fragment. Uh, when you're working on the set, um, I guess you must be feel torn apart between being a daughter, sister, uh, and being a director at the same time. Um, so how do you deal with that role emotionally? Well, the title of my film is Deal With It, so you just got to deal with it. Um, I guess for me, making my personal films is in a way, a way of dealing with the pain. So for me, I think I could not survive these situations without recording it. Because when I have my camera, I feel like everything has a reason and I feel powerful. I feel in control in a situation where I have no control whatsoever over my family, the choices that they make, the way society views them. Um, so for me, making these films um, is a way to empower myself and also a way to just keep standing. So switching between the roles of daughter and being a director and being able to zoom out on my own life, I think 
making personal work is better than any therapy session that you could ever have. Because you, as a director, you need to think about and reflect on your situation uh, while shooting or while you're in the editing room. And in a way that gives like some air, some breathing space in your life. Or at least for me, I can only talk for myself, of course. Yeah. Yeah, I, I understand. And a kind of follow up question is then uh, you say um, you, you are in control when you are filming, when you're shooting, you are in control of what is happening around you and, and, and very close to you as well. So uh, but then still, I would like to know if if and how um, if you collaborate with your family members while being on stage, uh, uh, while being sh while, while shooting the film. Uh, do you stage scenes together? Uh, do you talk things uh, constantly over? How, how does it work? No. You make it? Yeah. As, as it being a documentary, of course, uh, my starting point is what's happening in, in life. Um, but I can never make a documentary without the cooperation of the people that I film. So even if it's my family or if it's my last film was about this neo-Nazi guy, um, I have to have a close, close bond with people and we make the film together. It's always a joint process. I don't want to shoot about somebody. I want to make it together with that person. In this case, my dad was actually my biggest support because it was very difficult to sell this film. And he was the one who kept pushing me and kept saying like, you know what, if they don't want to finance it, I'll, I'll put some drug money on it. And I'm like, no, we're not going to make this <laughs> film with your drugs money. I'll just push through. But yes, of course, because I think every subject who doesn't have a voice and who is given the opportunity to be seen will take that opportunity with both hands. So yes, it was a, a collaboration between us. And of course, my dad realized what he could give me. So he also told me like, you know what, I really don't like you shooting me while I'm doing certain things, but I do it for you because I want to give this to you as a gift because I couldn't give you anything else as a dad. And that sounds really corny, but it is true. And I think everybody who, sh everybody who shoots their dysfunctional family members, also Rochelle, in a way, I feel like they give you a present and maybe that's a present that they cannot give you in real life interactions. And that's why they give you themselves on camera. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Hey, thank you so much. We definitely uh, talk further about yeah. this. So uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, and then I go to Mohamed Somji, our third panel guest. Um, are you here? Yes, he's here. Hi. And here. Hi. Thank you uh, for being here from Dubai. And uh, well, you may start with an introduction of your work. Sure, sure. Uh, thank you very much. I am going to keep it short and sweet because I think um, I'm really excited to hear more from uh, Rachel and from Shamira. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I live in Dubai. I'm, um, I work in the capacity as both an artist and as a curator and a director of the of a photo, photography center here in Dubai called Gulf Photo Plus. And um, you know, I, I'm from. Um, uh, our ancestors are from India, but you know we moved to Tanzania or East Africa five generations ago, and then I've lived all my life in Dubai. So these kind of this fragmented identities have has really informed and influenced um, you know uh, uh, me and has shaped kind of my thinking about life, but also you know my my, my life here in Dubai, which is in a way um, uh, the kind of perfect place. Um, uh, for me, because Dubai is a place where, um, which is full of, um, you know, people from everywhere else, except for people who are from here. And, and I think that, um, you know, it's a perfect kind of haven uh, for people like me who are from somewhere else. And, you know, I've, I've kind of grown up um, uh, living here with a multiple of other people. And, and so I've been exploring, you know, uh, the identities, uh, I've, I've been exploring the lives and the li lived experiences of people who are trying to figure out you know, uh, uh, while their li life is in kind of transience. And like in, in some sense, my life has always been, um, you know, temporary or, you know, this pursuit of like who I am and where I belong and where I'm from. And, um, uh, you know, Dubai being a, a home to people from, you know, over 200 nationalities um, who come here for work. And, you know, my father came here for work and, it, you know, uh, uh, we were here. And so, you know, we make these accidental lives here. And so that's kind of what I'm exploring in my work. And, um, and, 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 you know, even though it's, it's not in as personal in nature as uh, Shamira and Rachel's work, I think that in these people and in what I photograph, I see myself. And it's almost a self-portrait through the lives of other people. Um, and, um, and I think that, 
in, in the Middle East uh, as a, in my role as a curator, and we'll talk about that later. Um, but I just want to touch upon that now is this idea that um, uh, it's a really interesting way um, to, to navigate some really taboo issues by talking about your personal circumstances, you know, to, to bring up issues that are very much taboo in society. And um, I have some examples that we can share, some of which is also being uh, shown at Breda Photo. Um, but, you know, I think that that uh, uh, is a really skillful uh, way to navigate some of these issues that can be seen to be um, difficult or you could get into trouble. But if you bring it to a personal level, then you can perhaps, you know, find a, a, a smart way of um, bringing some of these issues to the fore. So I guess that's, uh, that's about it um, uh, for my intro. But um, I'd like to, um, uh, you know, for us to continue and we can, we can talk some more. So I'm trying to find out how to stop this. There we go. Yeah. Your share screen is stopped. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, I have a couple of brief questions for you. Uh, sure. When we sure. briefly talked about this panel yesterday, you said that you always encourage, uh, encourage photographers to cat personal. Um, and as an as a argument you uh, gave that uh, otherwise we tend to lose a human aspect. Can you, can you elaborate on that a bit more? Yeah, you know, what I was saying to you is that I think when you, uh, when you, share uh, personal insights or even um, you know work of your personal surroundings whether they're your family or your friends or your work or your life I think um, you know a you are you're quite you're, you're a lot more truthful and a lot more honest and a lot more um, incisive and because sometimes when you see things as a third person or you're looking at it um, from a distance or you're aloof you you know you you can perhaps veer in a direction that's maybe not very faithful to the subject, but when it's personal, you know, there's no holes barred, right? Like, you know, Rachel with her project confronted these issues head on. Same thing with Shamira, like it's there and you have to deal with it as, as she put it. And I think that, uh, um, uh, that can be, that can make for really honest, but also interesting work. And, um, and I think that, you know, we, we, we all know this, this discussion, du jour about documentary photography having to be objective and, and you know we know that we're past that and we have to be more interpretive and we have to be more personal and we have to bring in our reflections because you know uh, photography is never going to be objective and I think instead of like skirting around it if you get deep and personal you are a lot more um, uh, your insights and your your conclusions are a lot more interesting and a lot more weighty in that sense they, they bring substance and they bring um, it, you know, they, they bring interesting things to the fore. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, it's like to bring to the stage the lives you live yourself, indeed. So the lives we all live, but then all from this uh, personal uh, perspective, which can be stronger than indeed if a third person tries to make a very objective work about, uh, well, we have seen, we know all the examples of uh, yeah. poor families, yeah. uh, drug addicts, indeed. Right. So. Um, all right, um, I think I go over to Rochelle. Uh, I have a couple of other questions um, about your project. I suggest I go through uh, along everyone uh, with another set of uh, questions uh, before I open up to all of you and then uh, to the uh, Q&A with the audience. Um, so Rochelle, um, Another question that I have is that in our preparation for this talk last week, um, I asked you about the, the core of the project and you told me that you want to bring them all, uh, or in fact, what you, what you want and what you aim for, what you wish for, is that your family members come together around, let's say, a kitchen table, as you put it then. Um, is, is that indeed the goal of your project? Is that what you wish for? Um, my goal at first was um, not to point fingers at someone like you're doing it wrong, but more to um, make people aware of that what they're saying can hurt people or hurt e you can hurt each other by saying those kind of things and um, making people aware that they need to think twice before they blurred something out because I think that the society of now is kind of un not filtering their words before they before they blurt it out and I think that's the problem because it's getting more 
harsher and harsher um, in the in these times. Mm -hmm. And about bringing uh, your family members around the kitchen table, because from what I understand, it was also for them very insightful. They didn't know the stories yeah. from each other. <laughs> Yeah, um, every time I had this uh, interview with a family member, my mom curiously asked, um, what is happening to them or how they do think about this? Or, um, so she was very curious and I said, go talk to them. Why don't you know? Why am I only figuring, th figuring this out right now? And why are we not talking um, to each other about serious stuff instead of the birds and the bees? Um, so this is actually maybe, um, step to make them speak to each other more and um, I know that some people are more in each other's lives than the others but um, I think they do it do need to do it more more often yeah yeah but are you the one that is going to see that that is going to happen I mean I envision almost having them all around the table in the exhibition space or getting them all over to dinner at your place or we can do that, yeah. I think they're they're up for it. <laughs> okay, yeah. They, Get some they nice food, for, yeah. <laughs> I think, yeah. yeah, yeah. And they indeed would be up for that because it's it's hearing their their other funeral stories, secrets maybe sometimes something that they didn't want to share before. Now they share it with you. Um, are they indeed now willing to to open up also? you know to each other yeah they're opening up more and um yeah. they're hiding less um, okay during, yeah. yeah so you already gained something yeah actually yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that is then also in relation to my um uh, another question i have um so far you uh, depicted 36 family members like you said in your introduction there are many more um so are you continuing the projects or is it closed for you after the book and the exhibition will be um, public? I do like the um, personal stories. Like Mohammed said, uh, there you need to go deeper into the photography. So not only take a picture, a snapshot and move away from it, but I need, I, what I wanted to do was get more personal and deeper on um, the people that I uh, photographed. And um... <laughs> so that could be a next step because, because you also sa said in the beginning about my, as an answer on my question about the selection that you selected your inner circle, the people that you see most often, and maybe some of the family members are really far away. Uh, in a literal sense, but also in the sense that you don't see them often. So can uh, I could imagine that that you pick some of those people that you pictured already and um, go deeper with them in this subject? Or I think some would be up for it. Yeah, and um, I actually liked having those conversations with them and getting deeper and getting more to know them. And um, but for now, I'm still focusing on uh, making the book with my graphic designer. Yeah. So uh, that's what yeah. my, that's my focus right now. The yeah, book course. and the exhibition. <laughs> yeah, well, in a moment I come back to the, to the exhibition and I understand there are steps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, Shamira, I'd like to turn to you um, because um, I would like to introduce to our audience, I try to introduce to our audience the um, I summarized your article that you wrote for the film Krant mm -hmm. um, and I wrote it down <laughs> so I will um, so, so this is the like article just to specify after I made the film the first film deal with it that I showed you a fragment of yeah. I made mm -hmm. a lo loads of other films but I also continued with a with a follow-up film on my family yeah, and that exactly. film is something that I wrote a piece about yes so yeah so. yeah so indeed, I like to refer to this, what I almost call, uh, can, yeah, would, would entitle like a, like a kind of call you made in the film grant for the, um, uh, the documentary makers, producers, everyone involved there. And in that, in that article, you addressed a quite schizophrenic situation in which you receive awards, you are applauded for your efforts, but also about producers who ask you to adjust scenes as they seem 
not to reflect a reality, which is quite uh, remarkable, I guess. Uh, and you describe your life as dystopian, as being torn apart in which you see your family members have no control uh, on their, or hardly any control on their daily life. They struggle, um, they struggle to earn an income, to receive the recognition for who they are, but they stay invisible. Uh, but you continue that you might be the right person, as you know about this way of living more than anyone else, what you also addressed already in the introduction. And you wrote that indeed quitting the shooting process of a new film that was in the making might even be the ultimate act of love. Uh, so in short, what made you decide to stop filming Downfall of a Superwoman? As I, and I'm not sure about this, you were, are in the middle of the shooting or did you finish the film, the filming already? Um, and anyway, you, the article is about this decision not to show the work to anyone else, not to make it public. Yeah, and maybe I can later drop the link in the, do we have like a chat? I will drop the link of the article in the chat for the Dutch speaking people maybe. Very good, yeah. Um, this film, I shot it myself. I financed the film myself because I, I couldn't find anybody who wanted to have it, which to me is really <laughs> strange, but um, it's all about which perspectives do we care about more, most and do we want to see. Um, so I decided to finance this film myself and I've been shooting for the past six years. Um, so I have loads of material and um, it's about my brother and my sister-in-law. Um, and in that film, um, actually things kind of got out of hand because I was hoping to have like this happy end fairy tale film where everybody would be clean and off drugs and everybody is happy around the table, like the family of Rachel, but well, you can't script life. So during the shooting process, my brother committed a murder and he got um, jailed for 13 years and everything just like went off track from there. So I found that if I show this film to the audience, what will happen? What will be the impact on my family, especially in this climate that we are in right now, where we're a very polarized um, society, uh, right wing is gaining like a lot of, uh, they're taking their stage. Um, and I felt like if I bring this film, which in a way is a stereotypical confirmation of Caribbean people being poor and criminals, what would be the effect on them, on their future? Because I have to create this film in an all white environment. I have, like you stated, producers who want to have impact, who want to have a say on the way I want to sell a story, because we need to have viewers and it needs to be understandable and the people in the film need to be likable. But these people are my family. So I felt like, um, and if you want to work with a broadcaster here in Holland, you have to sign away your rights to the material, even your raw material. And I felt like I don't want to give up the rights to this film. I feel like the public is really obsessed with like poverty porn and with films about people who are on the lower side of the society. Um, and I just felt like I didn't want to give the audience right now at this moment, my vulnerable family on a plate for them to eat up in a way. Um, also because in the past, all my films that I've made until now have been used in records, police records, uh, records of child protection, protective services. So you are not free as an artist. Um, and that for me, like, like you stated, it's like my own films became, a, they became a weapon against the persons that I'm filming. And, um, so I started to think about what is our responsibility in this and, um, how can we protect uh, the people that we portray. And the decision not to bring out this film was, was very, very, very bittersweet because now this, their story will not be told, which was the whole point why I wanted to make this film. So I, I did, I, I do think that I will bring out the film as a fiction film maybe in the end. I, I think I'm gonna try and fictionalize the events and use actors. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it was, a, it was a tough decision as well because also because I know that the people will like this film because we like to, like I said, we like poverty porn. We like to look at people who are in bad shape so we can feel good about ourselves. Um, so I know if I bring out this film, of course I will, I will win awards and I will get all the applause again. But what price does my family have to pay for that? Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, I understand. We briefly talked today over the phone uh, because I asked you to show another fragment, um, but you decided, and then you said, well, I would like to show a fragment of the film that you are not going to finish. Um, but because of the reason, uh, but because the, the session is recorded, um, you don't want to share uh, any material. Um, sure. Because, because it's going to be online. Forever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I completely understand that. So that's a very good decision. So it will be something that, that well, that belongs to you and that will stay with you. Um, is there another fragment that you'd like to show us? Yes, I do, because, um, you know, when we make films about ourselves, um, like me for myself, I can decide which, which piece of myself I want to share with you, right? Which piece of myself is going to be online forever for everybody who ever wants to date me they can find it out and they can find out about all my all my traumas and shit right um so that's a decision that i made for myself but i really feel that we as photographers filmmakers should be should think about that decision for our characters as well because they cannot um oh they don't have the overview of the impact of something like this so i wanted to share with you my most vulnerable moment in this film of mine and um this is actually I recorded a phone conversation as a director, but I was a daughter at that moment. And I think that's why this is a good fragment to, to share, um, because it really shows my double role. And it also shows that actually, I didn't tell the editor that I has the, had this material, because I felt scared to share it. Um, so I hid it, but I did shoot it. So I want to give this tip to everybody, never censor yourself while you're shooting. Sen you can censor yourself in the edit, and then if you have a good team around you, they can push you so you can feel safe to give it your all. But never always shoot everything. You will see later if you use it or not. Yeah. All right. Okay. Sorry for the preaching, but... <laughs> no, it's fine. <laughs> all right, here we go. I'm <laughs> 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 I'm going to go to the store. 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 I'm going to go to Oh, never me deixe eu estar para me ver com bons sonhos, vou deixe eu não. Na minha realidade, tinha a sua realização. Estou com longa período de dias, eu estava a pensar em cada vez que eu estou, cada vez que eu ora, que eu vou ora ao pico, que vem. Estou a pensar que é de um, 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 de um. Não está mal um homem, não está mal um gai, mas... That's the way to go. You have to drink it. 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 That's why I realized that the woman who has 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 the woman. Andy has my life, I have my life. I have two women who have the esteem and have my life, and use it. If you have a woman who has the woman who has the woman who has the woman, 
Mi sa, la pasa de un jodimiento ahora está chiquito que con antes él busca manera un, un afleiding de usar droga. Bueno, usar sí. droga no, pero blow. Pero entonces está usando coca. Sí, está usando coca. Eso. Mi taza no. Sí, mi taza. No, mi no taza. Pero es la gama de un débito, si no con la gama de un débito. Mi no gana, mi no mi no sacha, mi no. No, 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 Oh, né? Mas quero sempre estar pito e toma a pessoa e me dindo nada com o tapito. Hum. Pero me dá só que tá doce com o coco com o sangue, que me dá em cabo de indébito. Pé, abo, me avisa a minha irmã no telefone, cabo, torci. Abo, não, alô, aduna a minha irmã pelo quilo, me aqui, são outros ali, rambas. Manda, não, manda. Tá um pouco por culpa, dá, mano. Por não, por ninguém. Dus mijn bieden zei, ah, bon, nou dat 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 zien ik hier, want daar ben ik nou, accepteer je dat je dat dat uit drogen. Nou, wel, die koei, men te comprende die komen te bezaam met koei, zo, men. Pas op, wat? Pas op, wat? Ja, maar wat, ah, bo, bij die koei je kaba, wat, bo, bij perdie kaba. Wat, bo, met die auto hamburg, met die stima, met die tante aan je koei. Wat, kerel, met die bij, gewoon, oké, ja. Laat je pas op kwenta. Ah, bo, ja, kaba, men, pas op, wat, bo. Bo, zak je, mieke, men? Nee, met die koei, 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 met die Laatste moment is dat met dat ding een probleem, die mens maar proberen die judeer toch? No, met dat je bent in gewaak. Zie, we worden wakker verband dan met toch? Sí, sí. Ik zag een boek lokaal maar als je nota bon, kijk maar. Maar ik heb een naaste, drie soorten kwartier lunen, bijna ik heb een mama gewoon, pero. Je bent een pure echte liefde geworden, mijn jongen. Mijn neem je deze jaar dat daar bewaarder, babiedi. Oh, mijn neem je. Vou estar festando, me dá querer que vou estar dependendo e te passo a bolsa aqui, vou estar todos os anos droga que droga se vou estar toda a sua vida. Não é verdade? Pensei me dá querer da bolsa porque me me nota quase que isso para o coamor, vou ter que ter que nem coamor da bomba para o fogo. Não é? Mas o soro para não ter um homem que está bem cá porque vou estar bem, está bem com sua droga, vou estar toda a sua vida com droga, já virá. E bom a massa que encolhe me dá. Oh, my name is you. Yes, so here I am again. Yeah, me too. I guess, like, what I wanted to show as well with this scene is that your camera can often give you a bravery that you may maybe not have as a daughter. Because as a daughter, maybe I would not have this intimate conversation with my dad in which he tells me words that are very valuable to me. But because I have a camera, because I'm there as a director, mm -hmm. it, gives me, it, gives me, it gives me a reason to ask questions and to talk about the difficult subjects. Which is kind of a contradiction because you would think that you would not dare to talk about this in front of a camera. But the fact that you have a camera there and you have this double role makes it easier. In a way, the consequence yeah, is that you then have to share these beautiful words that you want to cherish in your heart with the rest of the world. But hey, that's the price that yeah. you got to pay for it. <laughs> yeah, and uh, the, the camera then functions as a kind of maybe an extra layer in between uh, your father in this case and yourself. So yeah. the emotions are still around, of course, but it's maybe easier to handle them because there's something literally in between. Yes, um, you and exactly. your father. Well, thank yeah. you very much for sharing this uh, fragment. Indeed, it's tough, yeah. and it's it super is tough. Sweet. And but at the same time, I think this is real. Like for example, we have this this serious conversation while he's preparing his crack pipe to smoke, right? <laughs> and this for me was this is the reality that I wanted to show. It can yeah. exist. Both things can is, exist next to each other, and I think you only know that when you have lived this life. That it's not black and white. Yeah, exactly. Thank yeah. you for for this insight. I want to turn to Mohammed, um, because when it comes to the personal and the need to share a different story, a point of view, another approach, um, than we generally get, it maybe um, might be interesting at this point um, to go to your work as curator uh, for Breda Photo. You selected um, the work of Tanya Habuka if I pronounce the name well? Sure, yeah. Great. 
Um, it is in fact, uh, Tanya Habuka went on assignment from you as curator in close collaboration with Breda Photo, if I understood it correctly. And she worked on a project called Sacred Space Oddity in Israel and Palestine. And her project combines uh, still and moving images, sound, and also stereography. And it tries to make tangible the absurdity of the landscape. A landscape that is mostly pictured in the news as a stage, as an arena uh, of military confrontations and violations of human rights uh, right. that take place there on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. I didn't see the project myself yet, uh, so I'm really curious. Uh, please uh, share it with us and give us some information about her. Sure. I hope you book your train tickets to go to Breda immediately and uh, go to the KPN building and check out uh, Tanya's work. Yeah, so um, Tanya is a big proponent of this uh, idea of um, the political is um, personal, you know, and it, it comes from the seminal text written by a, a feminist in uh, 1963. And I think it's, it's as relevant today as it has been, um, you know, for all these years. And the idea is that, you know, if it's something you can't fight for something if you haven't gone through it or if you don't understand it. And the feminist movement in the 60s and 70s really, you know, were, were like, okay, uh, uh, we have to understand that the social, cultural, economic, uh, you know, uh, uh, oppression of women, you know, is the basis of all the personal problems that women face. And when you, when, you know, when they made it personal, they were able to kind of, you know, uh, um, uh, really kind of, drive for for societal change and you know that that fight continues uh, till today and i think what, what tanya does not just in the sacred space oddity but in in projects um, in her work before that as well is to break down this uh, conflict between in in in, in you know in palestine um uh, uh, you know, when we read about it, it's like this big thing and it's like this huge issue and these people have been fighting for, you know, thousands of years and that's how it's framed and it's really complicated and it's really um, uh, a dense thing and we, uh, uh, you know, can't understand it or it's too complicated. And I think what she's doing is looking at the lives of people in this, you know, land um, and, and, and breaking it down and looking for the absurd and looking for the sacred that has become profane and the profane that has become holy. And if you look at the work, there are these beautiful soundscapes and videos and, and you know, um, still live and, and, you know, still, still images of like lives that people lead, whether it's a Christian family who is into BD, a Christian couple who is into BDSM, or whether it's, um, you know, these people doing a rave. And, and I think what, what that gives you is a is a perspective that you often don't get because the story is always very aloof and very kind of you know distant and um, I'm going to share my screen just so that people who haven't um, uh, been out to um, uh, Cape you know the KPN building in Breda to see the work and you can see it's like this um, uh, <clears throat> you know this this a beautiful kind of kaleidoscope of work that is um, you know looking at uh, uh, you know, making this big thing into a small, th in, into like little fragments of lives of people's personal lives. And she's very, very good at interrogating that and, and finding um, uh, instances that bring it uh, home, you know, and, and like these two brothers that you see in the, uh, uh, in the top here wearing the red shirts and they, uh, they purchased this um, uh, plane or this plot of land and wanted to make an amusement park. And then it became part of a settlement and they couldn't do that. So it's lying empty. And and I think through that, she hopes that you can, you know, uh, build on uh, your understanding uh, in a more nuanced way of the conflict and kind of, um, you know, get away from the, the mainstream narratives about, oh, this is how this situation is played. And, and, and she does it in a very smart way. Um, and this is work by, um, uh, not so far from where Tanya's work is by, you know, two Gulf-based artists, um, Sheb Moha and uh, Chindi. And this was a very simple work uh, to, to bring in, but I think it's very important work because, you know, again, in the West, there is this perspective of uh, uh, youth in, in Saudi Arabia and, and in the Gulf to be of a certain type, you know, very conservative, very religious, and, um, uh, uh, you know, and, and these two artists um, have made basically personal diaries that they would do in, in their, you know, analog point and shoot um, uh, cameras. And um, they basically taken photos of, of their lives. And, and, and I think what it shows, uh, what, what I like about this work is that it's, it rejects both sides, right? It rejects the kind of formal uh, portrayal and representation by our societies here, which wants to portray a certain image. And 
it, you know, it, it also um, goes away from the other extreme of Western representation of people in the Arab youth of being, you know, angry men who want to like fight and cause trouble or whatever. And I think what you're saying is just people basically living their lives. So this is them, you know, um, digging uh, this uh, big hole to put lamb in to cook for uh, our Eid holidays. And I, and I think what you see here is, is a very kind of uh, candid um, uh, portrayal that, um, that gives you a little bit more of a nuanced uh, perspective. Um, this is a very quick example of a work by Tasnim al-Sultan, which is, uh, she's a Saudi-based artist. And, you know, tackling the idea of like love and patriarchy and, you know, uh, oppression, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, domestic violence is very, very difficult in Saudi Arabia because of censorship issues and like, you know, society's rejection of it. And she does it really cleverly here by, you know, bring, talking about her own work and, you know, uh, uh, talking about her own life and the fact that she married early because she felt the pressure from family and then she divorced and she's kind of now navigating uh, uh, life with two kids, uh, being single and, you know, uh, uh, um, and, and she talked to lots of uh, other people and, and photographed many different couples and she's kind of navigating that uh, subject through that way. Um, and lastly, this is again work by Laura um, uh who we showed at Breda Photo 2 years ago um, and she is again um, you know living in the UK from Egypt but grew up and raised in Saudi Arabia and she's again always kind of trying to understand what home means to her where she belongs and you know not not just physically in terms of home but also in her personal life you know uh, uh, having challenges with her career as an artist and as a photographer and she's basically making personal reflections again a very personal diary and all these things have a lot of meaning for her you know whether it's a um, fragments of a relationship or whether it's you know observations of daily life and they all you know have um, uh, significance in, in that perspective so I, I really like that work in the sense that it helps us you know, navigate some of these big issues into small fragments that people can relate to. And, and that's, that's about it. Okay, thank you so much, Mohammed. Instead of one artist, we got four. <laughs> Great, lovely. And an interesting installation of uh, Tanya, that is both, both installations, in fact, are, uh, you know, so surprising. And, and in Tanya's case, there seems to be a whole choreography with the cables even, so that go to the ceiling. So I'm very curious. I will, uh, I will go to the festival next week. So I will definitely visit those spaces as well. And maybe um, it is good if you if you will share in the chat the four artists that you just mentioned. Sure, hundred percent. Um, yeah. And then the host can can give it to the to the at attendees. So, uh, but it would be nice uh, because in the meantime, then I go back to Rachelle for one time, and then I try to open it up. Um, I also want to ask the audience already to come up with questions because we are almost at that moment that uh, we are ready for your questions. Uh, Rochelle, um, coming from this exhibition uh, that uh, Mohammed curated for Breda Photo, maybe it's a good point to turn to your exhibition, which will be part of the graduation show that opens the 7th of October, so the huge graduation show of our academy that, uh, well, normally is in June. Uh, what is nice now is that it coincides with the festival, so it's even easier for people to, to visit. And, um, and what I think is also nice about our graduation show uh, this year is that it's scattered around in Breda. Um, so uh, maybe uh, you could elaborate a bit on the choices you made for the exhibition so far. We still have some time to go, we can, you know. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I'm also um, curious uh, because you said that, um, that you in particularly liked the conversations you had with your family members. And how are you going to include those voices in the exhibition and or in the book? Um, well, uh, because it's going to be a book, uh, I'm going to add the quotes, some quotes that they said um, uh, onto the ex exhibition too. Um, so I have, uh, I've made a sketch out of how it's going to look. Um, so it might be looking like this, I don't know yet, but it's a possibility. So I have uh, a wall with um, a collage full of some pictures that uh, I selected. It's individual pictures and also um, 
family portraits and um, around the walls I will I want to put the quotes on the floor so you can go through the exhibition while reading some kind of shock moments while having some shock moments and um, I will probably hang some A0 prints um, from the ceiling. <laughs> um, okay. Sorry, my mic was off. And then a question about, indeed, there's this collage on the wall, there will be quotes on the floor. Um, and then uh, you have those pictures hanging from the, from the ceiling. So uh, what does it mean that the two layers or the fact that we can walk through it um yeah you can walk through it and um i think i i want to be i think you i i think that i want you to um see it as a big picture that is looking right at you like you're being um confronted by those uh people or that you some people look away so you can um kind of observe them how i observe them so this is actually what I want you to experience or try to. Okay, and in the book, uh, you will combine again the quotes and the portraits and the family, uh, the family portraits, individual and family portraits. Yes. Okay. Um, and and you hope to have the book ready also in two weeks' time? No, no, no. <laughs> okay. That was the plan in the first time. At, yeah, but um, Corona happened. Um, and uh, I, I'm going to take my time to finish this book um, as, as a good final product and not um, just throw some pictures in there and I want to make it perfect. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, I'm really curious to that process as well. Okay, um, I would love to have all the um, panelists now in the, on camera uh, because I have one last question well, not the last, last, but I kind of question to all of you. Um, and I would uh, involve the audience also to come up with questions. I see more already coming via the Q&A. Um, and I, again, would like to refer to Shamir's article. Um, I mean, I refer to your article uh, because I think it's, it's well, it, it was very sharp in a very good way. And it raised all kinds of issues that, that are raised for years, of course, but it's very good to hear it from you. Um, and there's something that I, I also struggle with as a curator and also as an educator for young photographers and filmmakers. And that is that you, that you um, reflect somewhere halfway or probably at the end of the article, like, okay, um, um, good. Uh, all those perspectives that we um, that we give on the world via our documentary work uh, could they change our perceptions of the world um, and at the same time you say uh, that you are very critical and wonder if that is possible at all and I think it's a question that 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 is always there in the back of our minds if we curate ex exhibitions if we make work if we teach uh, photographers and filmmakers um, for whom do we do this work and what will change because we are all very ambitious and idealistic in this which I think is good um, but will it do something will it make a change and then of course the question is how big should the change be what I learned for example from one of the earlier projects uh, creation projects I did is that it had a very strong impact on a very small group on a very small community very specific community in Rotterdam back at the time and it made me just so um, well happy in a sense I thought okay this is not maybe changing everyone's mind but at least it has an impact on those 12 people that were involved in a specific part of the project so it's also about you know do you want to change everything and everyone's opinion or uh, yeah what do you want to gain with it so maybe maybe Shamir first indeed yes well I always say if I can if there's only one people, one person that's touched by my films, it's already enough for me. It's all been worth it. But on the other side, who do I sacrifice 
to teach this person? Do I have to sacrifice my family to educate the collective is a, is a sentence that I use. And I guess that's a question that we really should ask ourselves. Um, yeah, I guess that, that, that would be, uh, and also who is your audience, right? Because um, let's be real, our audience of photography and documentary is mainly the wide upper class, right? So, um, and we, as people of different backgrounds, but maybe also of different classes, because I always say diversity is not just your color of your skin, but it's also the class that you're from, social class, etc. cetera. Um, we have been used to been portrayed through this gaze of the, well, let's say elite white, mostly male gaze. And now it's like we're shifting, times are shifting and we are claiming our own lenses and we want to portray ourselves, right? And um, where am I going with this? I don't know, I just wanted to state it. Stated that, that that's like something that everybody around us should be aware about and should give us the room and the space to tell our stories in our own way. Because a lot of times they ask for us to tell our stories through their lens, because that's the way we've been told these stories for all these years, right? So I want to say to young makers, sorry to be preaching again, but please don't let them tell you how to tell your story because you're the only one that knows how to tell your story. So stick to it because I didn't do that because I got caved in with pressure and finances and giving up my rights. Uh, so I just want to put an emphasis on that. Don't, fa don't fall for it. Don't fall for it when they say you, but this won't sell. This is not what's going to be popular because that's an old school way of thinking. Yeah. Who is your audience and who are you selling this to? Maybe the white elite will not get it, but maybe your audience is somewhere else, right? So, good. <laughs> yeah, very clear. Mohammed, yeah. do you like to add? Okay. Um, <laughs> no, I love what Shamira has to say. She's a woman after my own heart. I think that, um, you know, uh, uh, there's nothing more that I can add that she hasn't said, but you know, it's a, a very, very important. I think one of the things that she said, and I, Iris, we, we spoke about this when, when we had our chat that, you know, we have to be mindful of the fact that it's, you know, besides the, um, you know, feminist uh, people of color and LGBTQ, the other thing that keeps getting forgotten or overlooked is the, the idea of socioeconomic class. We're not, we're not getting enough stories or en enough of their, of, of, of their voices because this is a very kind of tight knit um, system that relies on, you know, grants and residencies that have their own kind of shackles. You know, uh, um, in, in, in my part of the world, for example, if you don't speak proper English or if you don't have the right passport or if you um, don't have enough documents to get a visa, you can't come to uh, the Netherlands or to the UK to, be, to, to learn uh, whether it's hard skills or soft skills. And I think uh, uh, it's important, uh, you know, to be able for those artists to not be shut out. And I think that they are making their own work and on their terms, but, you know, and in a weird way, it's because they have no other choice. And it's, it's finally starting to resonate when these two artists from the Gulf uh, were doing their personal diaries. They never thought one day that it would end up in, in the Netherlands. They were making it for themselves. And I'm glad that we are able to get them to show their work there. And hopefully some people will go, oh, Saudi Arabia is very different from what I thought. I thought they would always be sitting and like praying in a mosque, but they are also like, you know, listening to Kanye West and, and, and you know, partying and like playing football. And, and I think, um, you know, it sounds very simplistic, but I think that these things are important. Will it change the world? Probably not. And I keep asking about like the relevance of, uh, of, of the photo world. And I feel like we are making work for ourselves and this very small elite, but, you know, as Shamira said, if a few people, you know, resonate yeah. or start thinking about things differently, or if like one person goes to the KPN building and goes, wow, a Christian couple in a Palestinian couple are into BDSM. Oh, I thought they were just people who were throwing stones. Like, great. You know, Tanya's job is done. And, and, and you know, and I think that um, uh, uh, the more the more we start uh, thinking about the integrity of our work and what we're trying to say in our terms, rather than how it's going to be perceived or which grant are we going to get or what, you know, not being politically correct, the better it is, you know? And I also, if I can add something to that, because for all the people who are in attendance now and are thinking, oh shit, but I'm that elite white middle-class uh, cis heterosexual guy, should I just give up and stop working? No, because up until now, you have been you and I'm, I mean, in quotation marks, you, right? Because I don't want to attack anybody. But the stories that have been told through this male white voice have been the stories of the people of 
color or social class stories. I'm so curious to know about the problems that are in that are there in the Vinex. How do you say Vinex like in English? I don't know, but in the suburb suburbs, right? I want to know what's happening with with like where's your pain, white male heterosexual person? There is like a your voice should not be deleted. Just talk about yourself. Make personal work about yourself because there's like I'm sure there's like loads of gold to find in the suburbs as well. So if you're that person, don't feel like, oh shit, I can't tell no more stories because you, you can, you certainly can. And yeah. it's needed as well. Yeah, I totally agree with you. The stories are, are there in front of, of everyone, wherever he or she is and, and what kind of position in the, in the society he or she has. Yeah. Um, maybe I turn to the questions. Uh, so please, audience, feel free to ask any question. Also, if you didn't understand something. Uh, Not any please. question, though, but... <laughs> wow, okay. Make a remark and we try to, um, well, to work our way around it. I, I turn to the first question that was asked, there's a question for Rochelle. Um, I think you can read it as well. Yeah, I can as read well. It, yeah. uh, the question is, did you do some historical research on the Black Pete discussion? And if you did, how does this relate to your project? Um, like I said in the beginning, I didn't really care about uh, Black Pete, um, but during, uh, scrolling through my social media, I uh, got to know more about um, what was going on or what it was based on. And um, that's why I asked my relatives in the project how they are, what's their point of view on Black Pete? How do, how do they see it now? And um, how did they see it earlier, back when they were younger? Is there any difference? And that's basically what I... Um, asked them and um, yeah so I did some brief research but <laughs> yeah but can you give a uh, more concrete example they did indeed a few on that changed uh, uh, with one of your family members um, yes my mother for example she always celebrated Black Pete in, um, in Suriname and she didn't really think that there was something wrong with it um, she had some um, encounterment with uh, a boy when she was 17 and he called her Black Pete and, um, well, they got in a, into a fight. <laughs> but there are all, also other family members that um, were scared of Black Pete from the beginning. Um, so those are two opposite sides that uh, are in, in my family. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you. There's also a question for Mohammed. Uh, how do you find or keep a balance between being curator and making your own work? And then the follow-up question is, how does curating give you new insights in into creating your own work? Um, yeah, it's not easy. I find that I'm doing more of the curating part and I'm living um, vicariously through the artists whose work that I'm interested in, whose work that I'm showing because I think um, that many times, sometimes they do a much better job in, in um, tackling the issues that I'm, I'm interested in. Um, but it, for 100%, it gives me a lot lot of kind of insight and, and, and ideas and approaching my own work. And, you know, and, and I haven't been able to spend as much time as I would like to on pursuing my own work for a number of reasons, because I'm, you know, busy with other uh, curatorial, but also running a, uh, um, our photography center here, which, you know, in the best of times is difficult, but in the, our current situation, it's even more difficult. And, um, uh, but no, I, I, I'm learning so much. So for example, uh, I'm doing an assignment or a commission now for Ma Magnum Foundation and, and, and Washington Post and Tanya and I have been talking and, um, and you know, the roles have been reversed because she is kind of guiding me through um, uh, some of the processes that I'm going through. And I think it's a very symbiotic relationship and there, there, there shouldn't be this um, perception that like, you know, a, a, a curator is more like senior or wiser or like more knowledgeable. No, I think a curator learns a lot from the artist. I think, um, uh, you know, and, and I think um, uh, like for sure I'm, 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 you know, getting ideas, not just in, in, in the way the work is being done and but the approach and the thinking and also extending work beyond the, the, the classic photography, you know, and like Tanya has been using stereo, uh, stereoscope 3D images to kind of tell her story, which is really interesting. So I'm learning so much from, from that process. I hope that answers uh, 
you know, the, the, the question by Noor, but great question. Thank you, Noor. Yeah, and otherwise Nora will come back. Um, <laughs> I couldn't agree more what you say about uh, the, the the relation between curator and artist. It is it is it is really it should be flat in that sense. And um, and while I as a curator learn a lot from artists, and otherwise I really could not do my work uh, properly as well. Um, so there was a question for Rachel. Uh, did emotions ever impact your projects by having those conversations? I guess that is what the guest means. Um, and if it did, how did it impact uh, the project, the progression in your project maybe? Um, well, during those conversations, I got to know about a few things that were going on between those walls that I mentioned. And I was very shocked that someone would say such things to their loved ones. Um, so I was kind of struggling with, am I gonna tell the public their story or I'm gonna keep it to myself? And um, yeah, because it was very vulnerable, they were opening up and I didn't really know what to do with it. But um, I don't think I'm going to put it in the book with their name. So I, do, I won't um, connect the person to the quote, but I will mention it. So it's going to be kind of anonymous, but it will be mentioned in a certain type of way. Yeah, so you, in terms of kind of, you censored uh, the names to really, to pair it to, to the one who said it, but you don't censor it in the sense that you felt it very shocking, as you, as you told us just now, uh, because you find it very important that it's out there. Yeah, yeah. And some things that they mentioned weren't really um, connected to uh, the questions that I asked, but I did got to know some, some harsh, things um, that I, I, I think I'm got, I, got, I got closer to them because of those things, those conversations. Mm -hmm. um, but it really, it was emotional at some times, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can imagine. It gives you a lot, as Shamira also pointed out, but it also takes a lot from you. Uh, there's um, a question. Can I ask you something, Rachel? Did yeah. you? How did your um, family feel about? Did you share this doubt with them? Like, I'm not sure if I want to, you know, share this part of you with the world. And how did they react to that? Yeah, I, um, I, in the first place, I already took all the pictures, and I didn't really tell them very specific that I was going to put it in a book. Mm. So I had to get their consent. And during um, those uh, visits, I asked them about, the, uh, I asked them the questions and um, some people weren't very happy with the thing that they're going to be in a book. Mm -hmm. So I actually had to uh, um, convince them, that. yeah, convince them to, uh, to participate. But some people said, okay, this is not what I want you to put in uh, the book. So um, I had to make some kind of, some um, adjustments. Adjustments, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I think it's a great project. I really look forward to this book. Thank you. Really, yeah, compliments. Okay. Thank you, Shamira. Hey, uh, there's a question from Nora again uh, for all of you. Uh, you all make work that focuses on, um, that focuses on minorities. Uh, Shamira quite clearly stated that this has sometimes made making this public is hard. <laughs> How do you each, each see the future platform of creations? Do you see a change to be more receptive and inclusive for race, gender, sexuality, etc.? Well, Mohammed, maybe? Yeah, Mohammed, how is that in your country? Um, yeah, I, I, I think um, I'm, I'm not. I think it's a wonderful time for us because we are starting to get, um, you know, our work uh, uh, noticed. We're starting. I mean, the fact that you know I'm, I'm curating at Breda and I'm given the opportunity to bring work, um, and I think you know that has to then advance to a point where I'm getting involved also, not just in bringing a few bodies of work that respond to the theme, but also starting to think about 
you know, how to share this work and what, wh where to go with the idea of like the theme and stuff. But uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. I think that um, there are more and more platforms opening up. I think there are more and more collectives. And, um, and I think that amongst the public, there is starting to be, um, you know, an interest is peaking in um, the work of minorities or work by minorities about minorities or about, you know, uh, marginalized communities. And I think, um, you know, I, I, I I'm, I'm encouraged. Of course, there are lots of structural issues that need changing and dismantling and radicalizing, but these conversations are happening. You know, I mean, uh, 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 Breda Photo has been in, in, in the, uh, hot discussions about like a certain work that uh, you know everybody's aware of, I'm sure. And those conversations are really interesting. I've learned a thing or two just from those conversations, on, in, in many regards. And I think um, you know uh, uh, this is starting to um, you know chip away at these hierarchies and these, um, you know, uh, structural barriers that were there for, you know, artists that I work with and for the work that I would want, want to show. And, 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 and I think as Shamira said, as long as you, as an artist realize that, you know, you need to, uh, uh, you, you, you need to reject some of these, um, you know, stereotypes or these uh, challenges and kind of do work on your terms, you know, we'll, 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 we'll start make, making good progress. Yeah, I'm, I'm just like Mohammed, I'm also very positive. Um, I recently spoke to some young make filmmakers and they were like, oh, we were just going to do it guerrilla style and we just want to, you know, separate ourselves from the masses. I personally think that we are almost there. Hold on for a bit more because me, myself and people around me that I know are taking up great key positions in the film world. And as Mohammed is a curator, so um, it's already being implemented. I was on the jury for the Dutch Film Festival, so I got to nominate uh, the young talents. You know, I'm in all these commissions. I have other filmmakers that are in all these commissions. And um, so I feel like the platform is changing because we, um, we are here and our voice is getting louder and louder. So I'm very um, positive for the future because the commissioning editors are also gonna have to change positions. All the people that are in charge are gonna um, eventually we are going to take up those positions and I'm not, I don't mean we're going to take over and with me, we, I mean us, all of us in this chat. Yes. So I'm very positive about the future. Yeah. It's good to hear from both of you. Um, I can agree with it, but how, how is it for you, Rochelle, being on this, um, you know, this moment of graduation uh, before the summer and now uh, with the whole group, of course, with the whole class, um, are you ready to conquer the world in that sense? Do you feel <laughs> like that? Not really, but um, I'm trying. <laughs> but I feel like um, the, the class where I graduated in, people really um, wanted to tell their own stories or didn't really care about um, what the others will think. Just do your own thing and, um, and make good work, I think. Yeah. Yeah, so they're, um, they made their own stories uh, from their own personal uh, life. And I think that those were the, the best uh, kind of projects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm really curious to see them because I didn't see them myself yet. And uh, that's all possible in about two weeks. Um, and I even if you don't conquer the world right away, Rochelle, just be patient, patient, because yeah, I'm very. It takes time. I'm sure Mohammed knows this as well. Sometimes you just have to work hard for ten years, and everybody's going to reject you and say no, no, no. Even though we're in this great time and times are changing, but still, as a human being, you're going to have to struggle. So don't get discouraged, because artist life is like you're going to war every day, basically, right? You have to be a soldier. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, hold on, even if it's not going to happen in the first two years, maybe it's going to happen in the third, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and maybe in the fifth or the tenth. But, that's <laughs> in the, but, but I think it's, it's good to hear from Rochelle that, that, that she feels that her group, you know, is, is very strong in the sense of they kept to themselves. What, are, what is my story that I like to share, that I want to share, or that I feel the need to share with a bigger audience? And well, that will happen um, in a few uh, weeks time. Um, I think because I don't see any questions coming in uh, anymore. Uh, and I know we have another uh, film to show. 
Um, I think I, I'm going to close the panel. Um, I really enjoyed myself. Uh, this is not a topic that I'm usually working on, but of course it is all, it's always about uh, what is the position of of, of a filmmaker or of a photographer. That is in any case, if it's, if it's re in relation to personal stories, but also in relation to other subjects and topics uh, that they chose, uh, very important. And, and also for myself as a curator, it's always important to reflect on, on one's position. Um, so I like to thank you all three, uh, Rachelle, Shamira, and Mohammed for being here and spending this time with us. And um, yeah, I will say goodbye to you and hope to see you maybe in real life at some point <laughs> in time. So thank you so much. Great and meeting you guys. Thank you. Pleasure. And then uh, we go over to the last part of this uh, panel. Um, let me see. Um, yeah, because there is, um, again, for the Breda Photo Support Program, International Talent Program, uh, in each panel, um, a film is showed. In our case, it is a film from and about the Academy in Bielefeld, where the students uh, show their work. And the film is about 15 minutes. Um, and after that, I will come back. So I think we can start um, the film on Bielefeld. out there. It's still Corona and so I'm standing in this almost empty space at our school here in Bielefeld. Anyway, I'd like to welcome you here in the University of Applied Sciences and the Department of Art. My name is Axel Grunewald and I'm teaching photography and I'm also coordinator of our department. It's very sad that the festival of Breda that was uh, so enthusiastic during the last years cannot be shown in the same way as we have got it during the last years. It is also very sad for us that we could not welcome all the other European schools here at our place for the pitch that has been planned in March this year. Today we will show you three selected works from the classes of our BA and MA students. And maybe you get a little insight of what we are doing here at this place. We will begin with Carson Kronas, who will tell us something about his work, Searching for Mr. X. This mysterious guy from Tel Aviv, who one day got in possession of his smartphone and created his own visual world by using this smartphone as a camera. And Carson was able to follow this guy for some years. Then we switch over to Simon Schnelle and to his work, The Democratization of Heaven. Simon Schnelle finds a new way of mapping the world by looking deep into the archives of Wikipedia and selecting pieces of the sky to put them new together in a quite unusual way. Finally, Johanna Baschke will present her master project, Moments. It's a four screen video installation where she reflects her role grown up as a female in this society, how to act, how to feel and how to look like. I hope you will enjoy a little bit these films and maybe we see us again in Bielefeld next year. Searching for Mr. X. 
It's a book with 180 pages and a mixed media installation. This story is partly from me and partly photographed by somebody still unknown to me. It began with a night swim in the Mediterranean Sea with a friend during a hot summer night in Tel Aviv. Returning back to our place at the seaside, backpacks, scrubbed, uh, money and mobile phones were stolen. About nine days later, um, somebody took a picture with my stolen phone and automatically it was uploaded through a cloud-based interface to my computer. Exactly three weeks later, it was my birthday, the first image uploads in that the so-called Mr. X was identifiable in a mirror. The mirror hangs on the wall of a house which was recognizable on the background of a street shot I have taken some seven months before. It's a roof deck of a house where Mr. X also took some pictures. When I edit the documentary shots I took in the last seven months when I was in Tel Aviv, I was recognizing a woman on my photographs, which Mr. X also photographed after I did. So after these coincidences, I decide returning back to Tel Aviv and search for this young Eritrean guy. In these six weeks I was walking through the streets, going to pubs, bars and talking to many people uh, asking for this guy. I want to meet him, giving back his very brilliant shots and thank for his intimate view to this community which he was sending me to my Dropbox. So I couldn't find him after all this time, uh, but I could find very, very deep inside views to this community in Tel Aviv and I was deciding to go to Eritrea, his home country, to search for his culture. And Returning back from Eritrea, I went again to Tel Aviv and at one of the last evenings uh, I met an old Eritrean friend. We went to a dinner and this guy called Tikva came to the restaurant with a jacket with a big X on his jacket. I know it was not his purpose because he didn't know anything about the title of my project, but yeah, fascinating, still ongoing. Hello and welcome. My name is Simon Schnelle and I am the artist and founder of the Democratization of Heaven. In this video I will show you 7 steps to democratize your heaven. A short description. Some or aggregate of all that is real or existent. Other uses. Distinguished realty. BP semi-vandalism small equals yes. Reality is the sum or aggregate of all that is real or existent within a system, as opposed to that which is only. The term is also used to refer to the ontological status of things, indicating their existence. Rev. Site web error equals HTTPS. And Oxford Dictionary's com definition reality title equals reality. Definition. 
edition of Reality and English by Oxford Dictionary's website equals Oxford Dictionary plus English Access Date equals 2017 to 2010-28. Rev. In terms, reality is the totality of a system known and unknown. Site journal last equals Aragon PC. First equals date equals 2016. Title equals information. Reality. Modern physics. Zero equals journal equals international studies in the philosophy of science. Volume equals 30 pages equals 327 341 by equals. Rex. Philosophical questions about the nature of reality or existence or being are considered under the rubric of, which is a major branch of in the Western philosophical tradition. Ontological questions also feature in diverse branches of philosophy, including the these include questions about whether only physical objects are all that is, whether reality is fundamentally immaterial, for example, whether hypothetical unobservable entities posited by scientific theories exist, whether exist, and whether exist, equals equals related concepts equals equals, see also truth facts, equals 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 worldviews and theories equals equals equals. Further worldview, a common colloquial usage word of reality means perceptions, beliefs, and attitudes toward reality, as in my reality is not a reality. This is often used just as a indicating that the parties to a conversation agree, or should agree, not to quibble over deeply different conceptions of what is real. For example, in a religious discussion between friends, one might say, attempting to, you might disagree, it's in my reality, everyone goes to hell. Hello everybody, my name is Johanna Baschke and I'm going to present my project MOMENTS. MOMENTS is a project that is the product of a very personal process of reflection on gender. MOMENTS is a video installation with several projections, which is why it is a bit difficult to present it to you on one screen. Anyhow, I want to give you a short impression of my work. The moment when I'm ashamed to admit that I don't know how to use an impact drill. The moment when a man tells me I shouldn't carry so much and I therefore carry even more. 
the moment when I act like I don't need anyone, even though I do. The moment when I run towards a door to make sure to arrive there before a man approaching the same door, so as not to be a woman walking through a door held open by a man. The moment when it feels good that a man is lying in my arms. The moment when I change the topic of a conversation to hide that I don't know much about the subject matter. The moment when I'm happy that I never was a girl who loved horses. The moment when I refuse a man's help with fixing my bike, so I spend my time watching 20 YouTube tutorials by man in order to fix it myself. The moment when I hide that a meal is too spicy for me. The moment when I don't tell anybody about being groped because I don't want to appear weak. The moment when I'm proud to be able to drink more than a man. The moment when I wonder whether writing this text might make me too vulnerable, whatever that means. The moment when I hope, nevertheless, that I please men. The moment when, even though I should know better, I have a crush on someone who treats me like shit. The moment when lying in the arm of a man makes me feel good. The moment when I smile at someone who is being a jerk. The moment when I googled how to do the perfect blowjob. The moment when a man put his hand in between my legs in public transport and I didn't say or do anything. The moment when I realized that I started to eat less after getting rejected by a man. The moment when I agree on not using a condom. The moment when I feel that what I want to say is not interesting enough, so instead listen to a man talking bullshit. The moment when I wear uncomfortable panties. The moment when I'm ashamed of my labia. The moment when I think that men are only paying attention to me for sex. The moment when I feel in need of a man, although I'm just in need of a friend. I want my work to be a suggestion to deal with a topic, a feeling, an idea. I want to trigger a process of reflection. As stated in the pamphlet of Breda Photo, change brings the opportunity of freedom to be who you want to be. We are far away from this freedom and yet so close. And the first step for this freedom is reflection. Thank you very much for watching. Have a good time, take care, stay healthy.
that was um, an interesting insight in some artistic practices uh, from Bielefeld, the academy that is also part of the talent, international talent program of uh, Breda Photo. Um, so thank you, Bielefeld. Feels a bit now like I'm in the Eurovision uh, Song Festival. Thank you, Bielefeld, for sharing uh, the works of your students. And that also um, means the, the end of this two hour panel, almost two hours. And I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you gained some insights and um, I enjoyed myself. And a big thank you again to all you as audiences and uh, all of you in the audience and to the three panelists. And thank you Breda Photo for hosting this. Okay, bye-bye.